1758 and 1759, British fortunes had sharply improved in most parts of the world except in home waters. The Western Squadron spent much of 1758 under Anton's command once more, but scurvy and victualling problems limited him to six weeks at sea, which he once victualled at sea from transports on the coast of Brittany. In October 1758, now under Saunders, the squadron again failed to intercept French ships entering and leaving Brest. It was clear to British ministers that the Western Squadron had to do better. It was all the more clear as it became evident that the French government, with its naval strength and colonial position weakening fast, had decided to solve its troubles by at a stroke by invading Britain. Once again, the English Jacobites were to play their part, and again there were unrealistic hopes of Spanish, Swedish, and even Russian participation. By unorthodox financial manoeuvres, enough money was borrowed to keep the French Navy at sea for another summer. The plan was for the invasion force to sail the main fleet, which had to come from Brest and Rochefort. It was, however, impossible to assemble the army at Brest, which always depended on food and raw materials imported by coastal shipping from the rest of France, and which, by the spring of 1759, was already severely short of timber and unable to feed extra mouths. It was therefore decided to assemble the army around Vannes, in southern Brittany, where it could be fed, and where the inland sea of the Mohabin provided anchorage for transports. It followed that the Brest fleet had to sail down to collect the transports before returning to the English Channel. It followed, uh, it followed for the British that Brest was now the key point. Intermittent cruises in the western approaches would not suffice. It was necessary for the Royal Navy, for the Western Squadron, to be continually off Brest, or very near it. Never before had the Royal Navy faced the dangers of a close blockade of Brest. And the geographical situation needs to be explained, for wind, tide and navigation were as always limiting factors in naval operations. Brest Dockyard lies on a narrow river, the Penfield, issuing onto a huge enclosed roadstead, which itself communicates with the sea by a narrow channel, the Goulet. Lying almost east and west with high ground on both sides. Outside the Goulet are two anchorages, Berthamu Bay on the north and Camaray Bay on the south side, themselves screened from the open Atlantic by extensive reefs and islands, through which there are three passages. To the westward, the Eroes is open but scattered with dangerous pinnacle rocks. To the northward, the narrow and rock-strewn Fall with its formidable tide races leads into the English Channel. To the south, the Chose Citizen, a long chain of reefs and islands known to the English as the Sants or Seams. Stretches westwards into the Atlantic. Though, it were, if, though it, there is, through it, there is one deep but very narrow channel, the Raz de Seine, with the Tervanac Rock in the middle of the channel at its northern end. The tide runs through the Goulet at three knots, the four at four and half knots, and the Raz at seven knots. None of them could be passed except with the tide, and as it's, it is 25 miles from the Goulet to the Raz, it required exact timing to pass both at the same ebb, or inward bound on the same flood. So that squadrons often had to anchor at least one tide in Berthamu or Karama Bay. The distances are such that there is no one position from which a fleet could watch all three channels out of Brest, except close in with the Goulet, where they meet. But neither is there any ground high enough for the watchers on the mainland of Brittany to see far enough out to sea to locate a blockading squadron in the offing. In the prevailing southwesterlies, it was easy for French ships to enter the Goulet, but to leave required an easterly or northerly wind. Commonness in the late winter and spring between January and May. At other times of the year, the chance to sail from Brest usually came when one of the regular depressions blew in from the Atlantic over the British Isles, causing the wind in the channel to veer northerly and easterly. Overall, it is possible to sail from Brest on about 40% of the days of the year. Because they were often sailing in northerly winds, and because they often wished to avoid a bridge, the French tended to use the Raz de Seine more often than the other channels. For a different reason, inward-bound squadrons often came the same way. It has been explained why Ushant was, dangerous to, uh, was a dangerous landfall. No sane navigator, unsure of his position after weeks of sea, would head straight for Brest. Lest of all navigator plotting on the Neptune Francois, the official French chart atlas from 1693 until 1822 which lays down the port 35 miles out of position. Instead, French ships usually came in from the Atlantic on the parallel of Belle Isle, an excellent bold landfall from which a southwesterly wind would carry a ship on the port tack to Lorient and Brest, or on the starboard to Nantes, Rochefort and Bordeaux. Alternatively, they might first make Cape Finisterre or Cape Botigal to fix their position and then strike northeastward across the bay to Belle Isle. From Belle Isle, ships could approach Brest from the southeast, past the headland of Panamac, and through the Raz de Seine. 
For the British, this meant that any close watch of Brest required a squadron between the same as seems and the Penmax, to use the English names, in which position the Brenton coast is deadly to the shore, and the only possible escape in a westerly gale would be down into the Bay of Biscay away from home. The only reasonable safe position for the British squadron would be watching Brest is west or northwest of Ushant, with the channel open to leeward, but from here it is impossible to see that as the same. These were some of the difficulties Sir Edward Hawke faced when he sailed with the Western Squadron in May 1759 under orders to keep as close to Brest as possible. There he developed a system by which the main squadron was kept in relative safety to the seaward of Ushant, but in constant touch with an inshore squadron of two small ships of line under a bold and skilful captain, Augustus Hervey. Lying off the Black Rocks, at the inner end of the Eroise, near enough to Goulet to see anything coming in or out of Brest. Another small squadron was detached into the bay to watch Rochefort and the French transports in Moribian. Initially, Hawke was to return at intervals to Torbay for victuals and water, but by August he had 32 sail line enough to take turns to visit port and still keep 20 or so on station permanently. At the same time, a regular system of replenishment with fresh provisions at the sea was developed, with transports carrying live cattle, vegetables and beer. This presented many practical difficulties, with deep lane merchantmen beating up from Plymouth to the blockading station dead to windward, and coming alongside to transship their cargoes in exposed anchorages or even the open sea. Great determination and expense were necessary, but as a result, Hawke was able to keep his ships continually healthy and on station throughout the summer and autumn. Now I know, normally I start these videos off with a shameless book plug, and I'm going to. But I wanted to do a shameless book plug at the beginning for Nicholas Rogers' Command of the Ocean. And the reason I'm focusing on Brest today. Now, I'm still going to make a shameless pl plug for my own book. But today's books. Far Distant Ships by Quinton Barry. Very worth a read. Nicholas Rogers' Command of the Ocean. Seriously, look at how thick that book is. Do you imagine there's anything that's not in there? And, um, other things worth reading on this subject. Oh, can I, can I get this, this very heavy tone? Ah, yes. The, um, corgi, corginess of corgi. Always worth reading. Now. Why am I talking about the Western Squadron when I'm talking about blockading Brest? Because that is what the Western Squadron becomes known for. The Western Squadron becomes this squadron which basically becomes the critical linchpin of the Royal Navy. Because if you can blockade Brest, which is the main naval base of the French, the one that they can actually operate their fleet out of, and you can blockade Rochefort, then they can't attack you. If you think about the Battle of Trafalgar, if you think about pretty much every one of the famous naval battles of the Age of Sail, they are more often fought by either the French fleet of Brest trying to break out, or they are fought by the Mediterranean fleet or other fleets of the French Navy trying to link up with the, uh, trying to get in a position so they can link up with the Brest fleet to break them out. Because if they can, then that is a major naval force which is going to cause the British and the Royal Navy trouble. I am a climbing frame. Anyway. Let me just deal with my um, powder monkey and his desire to jump down. You're cute. The whole point, therefore, becomes an episode in very, very strange technological development. And why is it very strange technological development? Because Britain is pretty much pursuing a policy which no other nation on the earth is trying to do at this point. This is a quirk, okay? It's This is the point at which some people, when you start saying this, people go, Britain is therefore, oh, you're saying Britain is uniquely advanced. No, no, no. No other nation has the need of doing this. 
No other nation is so dependent upon maintaining a blockade on an absolutely nightmarish piece of coastline to actually try and blockade as Britain. So all sorts of technologies start to get developed for storing food, for preserving food, for managing to move food, for organizing logistics, replenishment at sea. This is why when people turn around and go, oh, you know, replenishment at sea was developed by the Americans in World War II, and I'm sitting there going, no, it wasn't. They do a really good job in World War II, and trust me, the Americans get it to a high degree of modern industrial efficiency. But it was developed a long time ago to support this squadron. Why? Because the Royal Navy couldn't afford to have that squadron come home. When we talk about copper buttering, uh, copper buttering of hulls, the whole reason for that, again, the expense of this. Why? It's because of the winds that blow in and out. When we look at a map of Brest, you can see its exact issue. It's down here. You can see there's a little sort of red arrow on it. There's also a lot of other indications indicating various points around the country, mainly places where I can find good food. Um, I, for some reason, my Google Maps, I couldn't get them to disappear. So that, that's life. You now, know, you now know where some of my favorite restaurants are in the entirety of the UK. The ones which I love to go to have hearts, the ones which I enjoy going to are yellow, and the ones which are green are ones which I would like to go to. That's how I keep it. Anyway. Now, Britain can support this fleet from Guernsey and Jersey. That just didn't work with the way the winds and the tides go. They have to support it from Plymouth, which is all the way up there. Or rather, if I move this, so I can get round here side. Yeah, stretch, stretch. Oh, I'm stretching. It's, you know, sort of level the finger, but that, that, that way. I could do it with two fingers, but that's just gonna be weird. I don't know. So, there is breast. And you can see immediately some of the problems. It is going to be beaten by the North Atlantic on a regular basis. It is completely exposed. Any squadron trying to maintain it is going to be in a terrible position. More importantly than not, if you've got your squadron there, in a position, as they pointed out, to blockade it, if you get a westerly wind, your squadron, or if worse, a storm, you could get driven off and they can come out. So the French could come out on the same wind which drives you away if you are in that position. And then you're no longer blockading them and they can go through and do nasty things to you in the channel. There are two key positions for the British for invading the British Isles. Okay? Especially in the Age of Sail. Two key positions. We have mentioned many times Netherlands. Brussels, Belgium, sort of that area, Antwerp, and all those sort of that coastline. Because if you come out of Flanders, you can come down the channel and you can get to all the soft underbelly, all the nice beaches. Where's the other place you can launch to from the channel? Brest. So those two positions are, as far as the British are concerned, the most key strategic positions on the entirety of the continent. Control or dominance of them is absolutely critical for the British. One, they are traditionally allies with the Dutch, usually against the French. For the French, well, a land operation to control that bit is not going to work because the French army is always bigger and if you get the British army suckered into defending that, that's going to be the only thing you're going to do with the British army. So you need to have a squadron there. Now, the other thing to realize is that putting a squadron there does two other things for you. Because, as I mentioned, Brest is an absolute frigging nightmare to supply and support. It has to be supported by coastal convoys. 
So if you put a blockading squadron there, guess what you can do to those convoys? Hmm, yeah. You stop them. You stop those coastal convoys going in. And the critical best base the French have for their naval operations in the channel. And look at this fortification. Look at the level of fortification development they put into it. It is absolutely emphatic and very impressive. It means the British can't do a quick attack on it. There's a garrison there and everything. They can't just go in and wreck the place. But its supplies are entirely dependent upon bring them up the coast. Well, you might think, well, hang on, Alex, hang on. The French realise this, and this place is so critical. Why don't they start building a load of roads, i.e. make all roads lead to Brest? Well, A, that would be expensive, and B, wouldn't have probably helped much, because how much can you actually transport by road at this time? Let's be honest, you can't transport that much. Next problem. Okay, Alex, build a canal. Again. How good is canal building technique? How good are canal building techniques are there at this time? The geography around Brest, if we go back to this, even if you look at the modern road structure, which you can see on this map, it's not exactly brilliant heading to Brest, is it? Not exactly uh, fantastic. In fact, honestly, you've got roughly two roads going there, and that's still a major naval base to this day. Brest is still one of the biggest, if not one of the most, not the most important French naval base to this day, at least on the Atlantic. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, what you do if you're the French is you keep planning entire battles and campaigns which depend on this linchpin of operations because you've got nothing better and don't actually do anything about it. Because one of the things you find out very quickly when it comes to French naval warfare planning, especially after from Chosul onwards, is that it's big on grand plans, very big on grand strategy, not so big on long-term investment in infrastructure. And what I mean by that is they have the ideas, they do know the problems, they know this problem exists, but they also have huge land borders and they have large armies on those land borders they have to deal with, and large armies they want to send over those land borders to get more land and to deal with problems, and they have their own internal issues. And all of those things combined mean that Brest is permanently a threat for the Royal Navy because of its sheer geographic location, and something they need to develop themselves to, in order to deal with. But Brest itself... never really lives up to its potential of its geographic location because the supplies are needed to get to Brest in order for Brest to operate are never really a viable. A viable. In peacetime, you can move the supplies you want there. You can get whatever you want there. And you can try and stockpile them, but again, supplies only last for so long. This is one of those interesting things, is that the British, due to their obsession with developing and preserving food to support the Western Squadron actually develop the infrastructure and industry which would be needed to actually make Brest work in a way. Because if you'd been able to supply Brest in peacetime, like the Royal Navy supplied the Western Squadron in wartime, 
and stockpiled and stored up huge amounts of supplies there, then potentially they could have done more. But that's not even the biggest problem for the French with the Western Squadron and Brest. It's the fact, as said, you cannot really spot whether a squadron's in the offing sitting out there. You have to presume they are, because they normally are. Which gives the Royal Navy a bit of a leeway. As long as they have some ships on station that can look like an inshore squadron, look like they're signaling to something else, they can fake it. For a little while. Now the bluff usually does get called, but usually despise them at a couple of days here and there. And also, there is the other advantage. While the French are in Br uh, Brest, they're not out at sea. The Royal Navy, the advantage which is often forgotten about the Royal Navy in the Napoleonic Wars is the amount of time they're getting at sea. They are at sea almost constantly. In every war, pretty much the Royal Navy will have almost its entirety of its strength deployed at sea over the course of the war, and quite often a very high proportion of that strength. And when we were talking originally, we were talking and mentioning that they had 32 ships of line allocated to the squadron. And of those, they could guarantee to have 21, 22, usually off breast at any one point. And the others would either be stocking up in Plymouth or sailing backwards and forwards between Plymouth and the squad blockading squadron. It means you're spending an awful lot of time under sail. It means you're also spending an awful lot of time with nothing to do but gunnery drill. We have nothing to do but practice sailing drill and practicing and keeping your vessels clean. It means you've got a lot of stuff being done to keep your crew busy because otherwise sitting on a ship off the coast becomes very boring. But that very, very creative, from let's be honest, busy work to keep them busy and to give them something to think about actually start improving their proficiency to the point at which you have not quite a veterancy program because you can't make someone a veteran without them going through the realities of actual combat at this time well any time really but you can make them experienced and they have to draw a sort of line between experience versus a veteran, because these days we usually use veteran for anyone who's served in the armed forces. And that is an acceptable use, that's a fine use, but when you're talking about it from an operational combat perspective, there is a difference between people who have been through combat, there is some positives and some negatives about that, and people who haven't, for whom it's that combat is going to be their first time. So, in this scenario, when we're talking about veterans versus experience, we're talking about the people who have served a lot of time at sea versus people who have served a lot of time at sea, maybe, and also fought in combat. But that's the other thing that builds up. Because of them being at sea all this time, you suddenly get, A, a lot more opportunities for combat, which improves veterancy and improves the experience, but... More importantly, with everyone at sea at this time, there is a lot of spaces for promotion, for capabilities, for people to move around between ships when they're assigned for differing roles, which means you spread the experience. So almost every ship is going to have a proportion of its crew who are veterans, a large proportion of its crew who are going to be experienced. And so this is going to impact the ship because it means the ship's going to be already on a higher level of of, of potentiality before it actually gets into combat. Then we have the Western Squadron and its creation in history. Now we can take it back as far as 1650 and a Captain William Penn. Great name. It was set up to guard the coast basically from the channel uh, of the channel from Beachy Head to Land's End. It has six ships. 
And yeah, what's its primary role? Well, it's got two. One of them is to deal with the potential operations of slavers, which was still a threat at this time. This is going to shock some people, but there used to be regular ships which would come out of North Africa, which would raid the Spanish coast, the French coast, the British coast, the Irish coast. Um, they even sometimes got further up, in, especially in rural areas, and they would basically be taking people for capturing them to take them back to slavery. Humanity. Pretty much constantly terrible to each other. Now, that squadron, its job was that. Its job was also dealing with smuggling. Its job was, to an extent, also dealing with potential threats but from royalist forces. But we'll leave that to one side. And it continues after the Restoration. In 1690, the squadron gets a special emphasis when Edward Russell, who's the first Earl of Orford, not Oxford, Orford, is given command. And he's given the command of the fleet you know, for the purposes of in the channel for defending the nation. So it's given the Western Squadron. From 1705 to 17, well, 1740s, the Western Squadron is pretty much a cruising squadron. Now, why is it a cruising squadron? Well, a cruising squadron is a fleet or large formation which comes back to port to restock and then goes out on cruises and cruises around and basically its purpose is to sit at a certain point in the channel or well when I say sit orbit around a certain point in the channel theoretically and protect British convoys when they come home especially but also if the French fleet comes out to engage and fight them and that's considered the best idea for what they can do at the time because how do you do anything else Think about that. We take logistics and replenishment at sea for granted. But before you start thinking about how to do it and actually doing it, how do you replenish a fleet? Well, you replenish your ships by bringing them back to port. If you have a small fleet, you basically have to bring them all back at the same time because leaving... So uh, if you've only got a small fleet, let's say you've got a dozen ships and you bring back a third of the time, well, then you're going to have actually eight ships out there. And if you only have eight ships out there and your opponent has ten ships, you're in trouble. So if they have 20, 20 ships, you need at least 20 ships out there. So to have your third out there, you need 30 ships. And you need to work it out and also work out what is the odds of how many people are going to be coming back and forward. What, how are you going to organize the structures? So before you have a, what you have is the whole fleet comes back to harbour, restocks, sorts itself out, and then goes out again. In 1746, uh, the Admiralty authorised Admiral Anson to combine all the channel commands into the Western Squadron. Now, this is based in Plymouth, and this is important as, well, it turns the Western Squadron from being one of the cruising squadrons into being THE cruising squadron. So this means all the other squadrons get combined in. So instead of having lots of squadrons cruising about, they will combine into one squadron. Think about that from the numbers perspective. Okay, now you've gone from your dozen ships to your 30 ships. It starts to work. So that's the first real step in building up to what starts to come about. Anson and Hawk start to redefine the mission in their sort of terms and command. During the Seven Years' War, the Western Squadron is therefore, as I will point out, because of the importance of Brest, it's arguably the, Britain's most critical military asset is the Western Squadron because of its role. Frequent patrolling of the entrance of the English Channel sweeps into the Bay of Biscay and waters of Shunt serve to keep others from threatening Britain itself, mostly. However, when combined with other responsibilities of trade protection, now trade protection is always an interesting one to be combined with, 
if you're combining your role with trade protection, you have probably managed to reach the trifecta of, um, how do I put this politely, of modern command, in that you are trying to multi-hat. And that's always fun when you have to multi-hat. Now, This is particularly important for the East Indies and West Indies convoys. These convoys are absolutely critical financially to Britain's ability to support its fleet. They are the trade grease which keeps the British cog of empire, uh, British cog of industry, let alone nationality and empire, going. With them, they can do things. Without them, they can't. Now. It's at this point they start to develop the other ideas for how to run a blockade. And this is when Brest and blockading Brest starts to become a viability. But it's also when you start to get politicians being more and more involved in what's going on. Interesting enough, though, it's also when you start to get a lot more infrastructure being considered for what they need to do. And there is a lot of infrastructure being considered for what they need to do. Now, here are some of the commanders who have been involved. Now, I'm sorry, I realise this bit is going to be stitched together because, well... I got called in to take the fluff for lunch. So, as you can see, I put Captain William Penn here. We're not quite a hundred percent sure over who takes over next. There is a debate because the letters seem to go to one officer, but he's also not the most senior officer or the one command uh, commanding the most powerful ship. So, there is a captain who's more senior by, by experience, so theoretically should be the senior captain in charge. There is the captain who's in charge of the largest, most powerful ship. And there is the another captain who's in charge of neither the largest, most powerful ship, nor, nor the most senior. And yet, he gets the letters from the government. So, um... There's politics going on. A lot of politics. Later on, of course, we have Admiral of the Fleet, Edward Russell. Then Vice Admiral Lord Anton. Then Rear Admiral Sir Peter Warren. Then Admiral Sir Edward Hawke. Then Admiral John Bing. Then Vice Admiral Lord Anson comes back. Always nice to know he can return. It's quite good when he's there. Then Vice Admiral Sir Charles Saunders. Then Admiral Sir Edward Hawke. <laughs> Pardon me. But this is there is another reason this is recorded in sections because of the illness that actually stopped the live happening. And Admiral Augustus Keppel who, well, let's be honest, has some interesting things with the Palliser affair. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then it goes Hardy, then Admiral Sir Francis Geary, then Vice Admiral George Darby, again, a good officer. Earl, Admiral Earl Howe, ooh, that's a decent officer, let's be honest. Anson Howe, there's a reason they get King George V's named after them. Commodore Sir John Lindsay, Commodore Sir John Leveson Grower, Pretty darn senior officers. Now, Admiral Hurl Howe is now back again. Always good. Then Admiral Sir John Bollars Warren. Then Admiral Edward Pellew. Again, pretty scary officer to be put in charge. Uh, Admiral Lord Brimpout. He's in charge 1795-7 as a temporary command, which lasts two years. And then he's put in permanent actual command for three years it's it's just amazing you know temporary command lasts two years actual command lasts three years total command five years admiral lord st vincent con wallace 
then Ghana, then a St. Vincent again, then Ghana, then Gambia, then Charles Cotton, then Lord Keith. And eventually, 1831, we have Codrington. And then we have Collier, Parker, Napier, and Corrie, who are the commanders in sort of the mid 19th century. When it's still an important part of the Royal Navy's formations. That might sound strange, you're sort of thinking, well, hang on, what's going on then? They're still having threats from, uh, threats from France, still threats from Spain, and Brest is still the major base for the French, so that's where they are. That's where they go. I know this is another diversion, but please, never eat my sister's cooking. Right then. So... Here is the interesting thing. The Western Squadron is, from its starting point, something which requires support and development to support it. The first thing they have to do is, well, in 1692, after the French make their primary fleet base to Brest, because it is one of the most suitable harbours for them to base them, in theory, due to its position for getting up into the channel, etc., and therefore it's also its access to the Atlantic for going over to other areas in the world. It's, it's a great base from that perspective. In 1698, six years later, the Admiralty, they try and run things from Portsmouth, they try and run things from using Torquay for a bit, they try and run things even from Chatham, they realise very quickly this don't work, and so in 1698, after having spent the last three years surveying the south coast of England, or rather Devon and Cornwall, quite, quite thoroughly, um, the other option being strongly considered was Falmouth Bay. Because Falmouth and St. Moors already have a significant level of defence built into them. But it was decided it was too hilly and wouldn't give you the required space to build a dockyard of sufficient scope to allow space for expansion. So they built a dry dock and a wet dock in Plymouth. And by 1798, that is a hundred years later, if you look there you'll notice there are seven, eight dry docks one which is a practically a double dry dock so that could really count for ten um, a couple of wet docks decent wet docks and several moorings barracks storehouses all the facilities needed for maintaining and uh, maintaining a fleet a hundred years starts off with a single dry dock and a single wet dock The sheer development of Plymouth in contrast to Brest shows you the reality of something which is a strategic would like to have versus strategic must have. In many ways I would argue that by plumbing for Brest, the French basically plumb for their equivalent of Falmouth and St. Moors. I love Falmouth and St. Moors. I love Cornish family roots. Yeah, that, that's the huge amount of family still down there. Friends down there. I love Cornwall. But, if I'm being honest, the place that's easier to develop, easier to access, easier to build up roads to, get supplies to, is Plymouth. It's easier. And it's also easier for Britain to move supplies around by the sea, because again, here's the scenario. The British are blockading the French fleet in harbour at Brest. 
which stops the French supplies, which are moving by sea, from being able to move by sea to Brest. However, that also means there aren't as many French ships getting out, which can interfere with British supplies moving by sea, and then if the British then just convoy them. That's another thing which, by the way, uh, four freights get used a lot for. If you find four freights operating in the Channel Squadron, etc., and things like that, you'll often find them with convoys. Because there is going to be nothing larger than them, get large enough to fight them, getting out of the French ports to go and attack the convoys. So it's an automatic bump. Occasionally, you even find third rates along with very important convoys. And it works. But this is all possible to do because of what's being done off the French coast. Which is all possible to do because in peacetime and in wartime, the British are able to consistently invest in their naval infrastructure. Why? Because for Britain, where is the land border? The army is something that is sent elsewhere to go and fight. There is a garrison maintained in the UK to protect against if the enemy actually do reach Britain and to defend places like Plymouth and Portsmouth and all the critical naval bases tend to have garrisons in them. But ultimately they don't have a large land, bar land border which means they need to have a large army sitting in the field somewhere in Britain. They don't. And if you can keep that army in some form of barracks in some form of fortress Nicely organized, supported in a fixed location that you can build supplies into in peacetime and in war, that you don't have to keep moving the supplies around, you don't have to deal with all the issues that come from moving the supplies around. It's brilliantly, at, brilliantly easier and a lot cheaper. A lot cheaper than what the French have to do to maintain and sustain their armies. Because again, as I've mentioned several times, it's actually easier to transport stuff by sea, which is why Brest seems to work so well on paper, but without the roads, without the canals, or anything that's built into it, you can't get the supplies into it. And an army... Well, again, how do British tend to support their armies? They're moving the stuff by sea. Why? Because, again, that's cheaper and quicker and easier than moving it by road. If you're always trying to sustain your armies by road, you either have huge wagon trains or you're living off the land, which means you're a constant plague when your army goes through. Now, that can work for a short time, but that means you can't leave an army in a location. You have to keep moving. You can't hold ground. You have to constantly go on the offensive. Why? Because you can't feed your army if you keep it in one location. And you can't go back because you've already been there and you've already wiped out the food population behind you, so you can only go forward. It's great for maintaining an offensive spirit. We march that way or we starve. It's terrible for organisation. So, the battles of Barfleur and La Hogue. Now, these are some cool battles. And these are described by, of course, Winston Churchill, who is never known for overstatement, as the Battle of Cape La Hogue, with its consequent actions, broke decisively for the whole of the wars of William Man, all French pretensions to supremacy at sea. It was the Trafalgar of the 17th century. Beautiful. But let's be honest, it takes place at the end of the 17th century. Now, the actual battle itself, well, from England at this point, and the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, under the command of Edward Russell and Philips van Almond, they produced 82 ships of the line, 3 fire ships, and 39,000 men. The French, under the command of uh, 
Anne Hilarion de Consequin Comte de Tourneville. A double N E. Mm -hmm. And Bernadine Belfond had 44 ships of line, two frigates, a single fire ship, and 21,000 men. The Battle of Trafalgar is great because the smaller British fleet deals decisive am uh, damage to the combined Franco-Spanish fleet so that they can't free the Brest fleet to grow even larger and therefore get even bigger before they make a move on the channel. When you have 82 ships versus 44 ships, it's not quite 2 to 1, but there is certainly an advantage going on here. Both sides suffered roughly 5,000 killed and wounded. The Anglo-Dutch forces lost two ships of the line and three fire ships, were, of course, were destroyed, being used. The French forces lost 15 ships of the line, destroyed, two frigates destroyed, and a fire ship destroyed. Now, I find it very interesting that they lose a third of their ships and apparently have the same number of killed or wounded as the Anglo-Dutch forces who lose less than a fortieth of their ships. The Anglo-Dutch have 39,000 personnel, the French have 21,000. There's some interesting maths going on here somewhere. Now, the battle was, well, it was part of the Nine Years' War. And, as mentioned, Edward Russell is in charge. The fleet sight each other on the 19th of May off Cape Barfleur. Now, the King of France had ordered Tourville to engage. However, he decides not to. He decides to try and avoid engagement because he realizes how outnumbered he is. He, Tourville had also been advised by James II to expect some defections by English captains with Jacobite sympathies. Uh, none did. James II always thought there were going to be um, def uh, there were going to be defections by English captains. Not quite sure who kept spinning him that line, but obviously it was someone who liked to use his wine cellar a lot. Now both the fleets split into three squadrons. Each squadron was split into three divisions, and each division is commanded by a flag officer. Now, it's slightly different on the Anglo-Dutch side than the French side, because I think there is some similarity in the command structure, but to me, it's slightly... The Anglo-Dutch one, because they're dealing with 82 ships, is slightly more um, encompassing. Despite them having seen each other at first light, they didn't engage until 10 a.m. This was because the weather was calm, and Tourville, holding the weather gauge, was trying to break off the engagement and keep as far away as he could, whilst also still carrying out his orders to damage the enemy. He reinforced the White Squadron in the centre, which was under his own command, in order to try and engage Russell's Red Squadron with equal numbers. Now remember, this is when the squadrons and fleets were always divided into red, blue and white squadrons. And they would have an admiral of each, and 
a vice admiral of each, and a rear admiral of each, and that's how you divide it up into the three di the three squadrons and the three divisions, and how it goes. It gets kind of interesting because also usually there are senior captains with subdivisions around in the Anglo-Dutch fleet because again it's 82 ships. Some of them are called Commodore because they're not the most senior captain in the group so they're given the pennant brevet rank of Commodore just you know mission rank and others, well, they're the senior captain in their group by seniority, so they're in charge. Thank the Lord, that does make life a little bit easier than the beginnings of the Western Squadron to work out. Now, Torvel tried to minimise his damage by extending and refusing the van to avoid them being turned overwhelmed, and the rear, holding his rear as back to keep the weather gauge. Russell countered this all by holding fire as long as possible to allow the French to come closer. Almond, who was in the van, extended to try to overlap the French line. While Ashby, who was in charge of the rear, and somewhere else, sought to close and bring his blue squadron into action. From around 1100 hours, and for the next few hours, both fleets bombarded each other, causing considerable damage. The battle continued for a full day and into the night. At 1300 hours, a change in wind allowed the Rear Admiral of the Red, Sir Clausley uh, Shovel, to break the French line, and the Dutch to start enveloping the French van. It's lovely. You have to have a gauge till you don't have to have a gauge. And please do note, breaking the line. Again, we talk about Trafalgar as being uh, interesting and Nelson as breaking the line and being innovative coming up with this, but breaking a line has been part of had been part of sailing tactics for a long time. What was more innovative was him actually doing it when it had been for a while, everyone got no, no, the line, the line works. Which shows you sometimes you can innovate by going backwards and going, hang on, breaking the line, they used to do breaking the line. Why aren't we trying to break the line anymore? Because the line is so powerful. Because the ships have got bigger and more powerful and they've got bigger guns on there. They're better crewed. But you break the line, it's decisive. But their ships are bigger and more powerful. But you break the line, it's decisive. A flat calm descends at four sixteen hundred hours at four o'clock, leaving both fleets in a nice fog, which does mm, allow them to continue on continue on fighting. But it's kind of, uh, are we sure that's French or is it Dutch? Can someone please check out the flag at the stern? Check out the flag. Wait till we see the size of the flag. Or fire and sorry. Why did you say sorry after shooting at me? Just in case you were uh, just in case you were on our side. It's better to uh, ask forgiveness than permission. There are options, but neither are exactly preferred in this in a, a fighting in a flog in a foggy battle. It's one of those interesting things when we start talking about modern warfare. Of course, we have IFF systems etc. that are used to try and identify friend or foe, but if you're launching missile systems, they go by the return, the radar return. So they can theoretically get spoofed off and get attracted to your own fleet if your fleets are in close enough contact and you're trying to launch a long-range missile strike. And by close enough contact, you have to think about what kind of speed of missile you're using. If you're using a modern hypersonic weapon, its range of what's going to be close enough to be to get confused can be surprisingly large. 
in this uh, in this age though it's a foggy uh, fog scenario and basically you want to be within poking with a big stick range to be sure that what you're hitting now at 1800 hours, Tourville was able to use the Tide to gain a bit of a respite, but Chavel then uses this same Tide at 2000 hours to launch a fire ship attack. By 10 a.m. the following morning, the battle is almost over, pretty much. And most ships on both sides were damaged. Some severely, no ships from either battle line have been lost by this point. And so at the turning of the tide, Tourville again took advantage of this to cut his cables and carry down the channel on the ebb away from the battle. Russell also cut when he realised what had happened in order to give chase. Later on the 30th of May, the French withdrawal was hampered by wind and tide and by the fact that due to cost concerns by the French Naval Ministry, most of the ships had um, anchors inadequate to withstand the tidal races in the region. And the nearest French port, Cherbourg, was not fortified, so they couldn't go racing to Cherbourg and be safe. This is the advantage of Brest. It's fortified. Have a look at it. Isn't that fortified for you? Now, of course, this battle takes place in 1692, and it's 1692 when the French make their primary fleet base at Brest. Ah, I said, did I say 30th or t no, 20th of May, sorry, 20th of May. No, 30th of May. That's right. My own notes. They've got 20 ships going off there and I read it wrong. On the 30th of May, the French fleet had pretty much scattered across into a wide area, and to the northward battle scene, heading northwest, were Gabaret and Langholm with four ships between them. They skirted the English coast and headed out into the Atlantic. Eventually, they managed to arrive back at Brest by going a very circuitous route. Very, very circuitous route. Another two ships put into La Havre, one of which, Lantern Du, was wrecked at the harbour entrance because, well, it was such a lovely harbour to get into. Nesmond, with the remaining two ships, Monarch and Amiville, passed through the Straits of Dover went north around Britain and arrived safely at Brest after doing a full circumnavigation of Britain. The main body head west in three groups, Villette leading 15, uh, Dan Farrell with 12 and Tourville bringing up the rear with 7. During the day they managed to close up but Tourville was hampered by efforts he tried to use to save the Solil Rule which was his Royal which is flagship which was, frankly, in a terrible t uh, condition, and eventually he transfers his flag to Le Ambitu. Le Ambitu. Um, Ambitu. I got it right in the end. On um, the 31st of May, the French fleet was anchored off the tide of Cape de la Hobe. Um, now, the leading contingent, 21 ships, just checking because whenever I read 31 on month I always check, just in case. Uh, 21 ships under the command of Panitaire had rounded the Cape and was in Elne Race. While the remainder, 13 ships with Torvel and the other flag officers, were to the east. The weather deteriorated, though, and these ships began to drag their anchors and were forced to cut and run before the wind and tide. Russell pursued Torvel eastward uh, along the Contian coast. 
Tourville, without anchors by this point, uh, was unable to do more than beach his ships. Three of the most badly damaged were forced to beach at Cherbourg. The rest, ten ships, reached St. Vast La Hogue, where they too were beached, joining the two of Nesman's division that, had al that were already there. Russell and the ships of him, together with some Ashby's Blue Squadron, also cut to pursue him, while Ashby and Almond continued to shadow Panter and Panetier's group. Panetier, in order to escape the Allied fleet, sought to make the uh, passage through the Alney race. This was pretty darn hazardous. He was helped by finding in his crew uh, a local gentleman named Hevio Rio, who acted as pilot when his navigators um, were not quite sure what to do. It's always nice when you find someone who's a local sailor who knows the actual route through and has done it. Although, remember, they've probably not done it in something quite as big as your warship. That's always a small problem. Armand and Ashby didn't have such similar people and decided not to try and follow him. And so they were criticised later by Russell for not doing so. Um, unfortunately, the only flag officer who knew the waters, Carter, had died of his wounds already, so they had no one who was a specialist. And again, this is something which develops over time. The British develop charts, etc., which are so good on the French coast, they can do these sort of things. We'll be talking about that a bit later. Panettiere later reached St. Malo and so in safety, while Armand and Ashby turned east to rejoin Russell at the Hogue. Um, the Sully Royal, Admiral and Triumphant were in such bad shape they were all beached at Cherbourg and destroyed there the next day. Vice Admiral de Laval, um, well, managed to help out with that one. And Russell turned on the remaining ships and man tried to destroy any ones which he could get to, which were on the beaches, so they couldn't be recovered. On the 3rd and, the 3rd and 4th of June, the um, English and Dutch attacked with longboats, and the French crews, which were exhausted and disheartened by this point, meant they sort of withdrew, and so the Allies successfully deployed shore parties and fire ships that burnt all 12 ships of the line which had sought shelter in La Hogue. And that's why it's called the Battle of Balfour and La Hogue. Because, well, the, la the ships which are really destroyed are the ones which are in La Hogue. And this is Edward Russell, 1st Earl of Orford. Please note, not Oxford, Orford. There is a difference. He looks a self-possessed gentleman. Lord Lieutenant of Cambridgeshire, Member of Parliament for Cambridgeshire and for Portsmouth. Treasurer of the Navy, Member for the pa uh, for Parliament for Launceston, and, well, served 1666 to 1717. So a nice long career of service. And a fairly decent officer from all accounts. Now we have the first of what I call the Edward Hawke series with the Western Squadron. And this is the Second Battle of Cape Finisterre. And this is when a British flat, uh, fleet of 14 ships in line intercepted a French convoy of 250 merchant vessels sailing from Basque Roads in Western France to the West Indies and only protected by eight ships of the line which were commanded by Vice Admiral Henry Francois de Heviers. Now, This battle ends with six ships of the line captured, 800 sailors killed and wounded on the French side, 4,000 captured, and seven merchant vessels captured. Now, I would say, out of a fleet of eight ships of the line, 250 merchant vessels, an Indiaman, and a frigate, that's pretty darn good for the French. You know, they've they've sacrificed their ships to the line, but they've got their merchant vessels away. Until you think about it from a British perspective. Those merchant vessels are taking out stuff produced in France to their colonies. Okay? That's problematic. That's going to supply the colonies. However, the stuff that's really valuable is the stuff they're going to bring back, isn't it? So you don't want to capture those merchant ships on the way out. You want to capture them on the way home. Then they're going to be a far more handsome prize. But this way, when they come home, they're going to have no ships aligned to escort them. 
Because you've taken six of those, uh, six of the eight. It works. Now, the French sailed on the 6th of October. Eight days later, they were sighted by the British early on the morning of the 14th, approximately 300 miles west of Finisterre, uh, the westernmost department of France. Now, as mentioned, the British squadron consisted of 14 ships of the line. But here is the point. The ships of the line for the British were the Devonshire, 66 guns. The Edinburgh, 70 guns. The Kent, 64. The Yarmouth, 64. The Monmouth, 64. The Princess Louisa, 60. Windsor, 60. Lyon, 60. Tilbury, 60. Nottingham, 60. Defiance, 60. Eagle, 60. Gloucester, 50. Portland, 50. Fourth rate, Hector, 44 guns. Two fire ships, Dolphin and Vulcan. And a sloop called Weasel. The French ships of line were the Tonant, 80 guns. The Intrepide, 74 guns. The Terrebal, 74 guns. The Monarch, 74 guns. Neptune, 70 guns. The Tridont, 64 guns. The Fogur, uh, 64 guns. The Seven, 56 guns. The Eagle, uh, and the... Well, yeah. And that's it. And the vessels which are captured. The Terebal, the Monarch, the Neptune, the Trident, the Fogur, the Seven. Now... The Terrible. The third rate Terrible is a very, very special ship. Because when she's looked at and when she's studied, this is when the British start to get the ideas, as I said before, about a 74 gun ship. She's also quite famous because she ends up with Samuel Hood serving as one of her officers. Now, at first Hawk 40 was up against a much larger fleet of warships, and so formed line of battle as expected. Her is actually initially mistook the British ships for members of the French convoy. He decides that his best plan is to divert the British to allow the merchant ships to disperse. And if he would do that, he would use his warships for this role. Now what would be interesting would be if he... It depends on how big, a, a, how big some of his merchant ships are, but some of them do seem to be quite big. He has at least one East Indiaman there. And so he could have, theoretically, have used this fleet and sort of used these ships to make himself look like he had a larger fleet than Hawk, which might have deterred Hawk from actually attacking. But, he didn't. And by showing how many warships he had, he revealed to Hawk that Hawk had the numbers on him. So whilst each of his ships were individually superior to Hawke's fleet. Hawke could double up. And that was basically the plan. So Hawke, instead of continuing line, gives the signal for General Chase, which orders each of his ships to head towards the enemy at best speed. Now, sometimes that's used to translate it as maximum speed. You would not be wrong in thinking maximum speed, but best speed is the actual phraseology. And the reason you use best speed rather than maximum speed is a very simple re re reasoning. You use maximum speed, then ships have a reason to say, Oh, uh, 
we, we we can't go as fast as you guys can, so it's better we clump up. And this is what Captain uh, Royal Navy Admirals had found. Captains would sometimes clump up for their own protection, or so they could act in a group. Because they come to agreements of sharing prize money if they captured ships together. Best speed. Make your best speed on your honour. Hmm. That was felt to have a more inducive effect on them. They can still do the agreements, but they're more likely to get up to speed. Now, at this point, the very out of his depth, the Herbiers, had actually formed up his own eye battle. He'd got the Indiaman content and the frigate Cats, uh, Castor um, to stay with the French, uh, stay with the merchant vessels. And. So he hadn't even taken out those potential ships to back him up in his fleet, and give him potential to make him look bigger than he was. So we're of about four miles of the French line. Hawk slows his uh, formations advance in order to permit the slower moving vessels to catch up. At this point, Herbier starts edging his line away from the scattering merchant vessels. Now, at this point, the British are given the sort of theoretical position of having to pursue the French warships, which allows the merchant vessels to escape, or pursuing the merchant vessels and run the risk of being attacked by Herbier's force acting in a group. But again, remember what I said about British strategy here. If you take out the warships, then when those merchant vessels are coming home, they're not going to have an escort, and you can take them all out. And they're going to be worth a lot more money than well, the position and condition they are now. Plus, when they're coming back, their hulls are going to be probably fouled, they're going to be at the end of a week, weeks of voyage, a week's sailing, uh, their crew are going to be tired, possibly hungry, depending on French provisions. It's going to be a far easier job. But you have to make sure the warships are out of the way. That's the first critical thing. Make sure the warships are out of the way. So. Hawk focused his fleet on the French warships. They attacked the French rear almost on mob. It's described as a loose formation, but it's almost a mob. Um, this enabled three British ships to get to the far side of the French line, meaning that the French, the three French ships at the rear line were being attacked on both sides at the same time by the British, and the British started to roll up the French, French line. This automatically means that any scenario where you go, well, the British fleet is individually weaker, doesn't matter. It's the kind of move which I would like to do in Empire Total War, but every time I try and do it, the AI ends up with my ships bashing into each other and having a par uh, having a M25 car style car park scenario going on in the middle of the uh, middle of the sea. The British just repeat this as they move up the French line. And this means that at some point, French ships are being attacked by not just two ships, but sometimes three or four. Often, those ships would open their attack by using canister shot to take, try and take out the rigging of the French ships in order to immobilize them. You also have the fact, and this is... It's starting to wear at this point, but the British consistency of being out at sea and using up the, few, uh, f uh, the food and resources to keep their fleet out at sea as much as they can means that the English sailors, the British sailors, are better trained, better disciplined. 
in sort of their fire practices than their French counterparts. Now, one of the things which has to be noted for being out of sea at a long time, and as I mentioned earlier, you do get more time for training, more time for practice. If we consider the Battle of Trafalgar, where quite a lot of the captains were commanding their entire ship with hand signals, they weren't doing any shouting, shouted commands because no one could hear them. They were doing hand signals. Now, you think about that, that's not something you can improvise quickly. You have to have done a lot of training before you can get a system of hand signals in place and your crew, enough of your crew to know them, in fact, all of your crew to know them, in order to be able to work with them and anticipate what the next signal coming is going to be. Because that speeds things up, to turn things into muscle memory. You don't get that level of practice, that level of proficiency sitting in harbour. Hawk is a really cool admiral, by the way. Let's be honest, he managed to serve three Prime Ministers, Lord Chatham, the Duke of Grafton, and Lord North. Serving in uh, just, just five years in the Admiralty, though. Three Prime Ministers. At a certain point, he was probably wondering, who's in charge of me now? They've changed so recent, uh, so uh, so currently, so often. Who's in charge? It was probably fun. Anyway. Of... Well, at certain points, the French just keep striking their colours. And by about 3.30, 15.30 hours, four of the four remaining ships, uh, three were engaged in running battles with groups of British ships. And... Each one had damage to the rigging. The flagship, the Tonon, the most powerful squad vessel in any squadron, was managing to hold off opponents, but was surrounded. And the fr uh, vessel which was at the front of the line, the Intrepid, had not yet been fully engaged, turned back into the fight. And so it was with Intrepid's assistance that Tonon is able to break free, and then two ships escape east, pursued by the British. The final pair of French ships, which had been left alone by their own fleet commander, um, find themselves surrounded by seven or eight ships, depending on how you count it, and basically surrender because they've been left. Most of the British ships had done what Hawke had wanted, which was to close the pistol range. Hawke was less than pleased with Kent. And so her captain was subsequently caught martialed and dismissed from the Navy. He felt he'd kept her too far away. That was the Captain Thomas Fox. Again, the whole action, you know, engaging the enemy more closely, engaging the enemy to your utmost, is so embedded in the Royal Navy culture. Even at this point, even in the beginning of the 18th century, that you sort of understand what happens with John Bing, what happens with Nelson, what, why Parker sends the signal he does at Copenhagen, because that's so ingrained into the Royal Navy. And if you're just, even when you are engaging, but you're found not to be engaging closely enough, you can get court-martialed and kicked out of the Navy. The British lost 170 men killed and 577 wounded in battle. Hawke himself is amongst the wounded. He was caught in a gunpowder explosion. The French lost 800 killed and wounded and 4,000 men were taken prisoner. All the British ships were damaged. All the captured French ships were badly damaged. Four had all their masts shot away. So they were forced to lay to for two days to carry repairs. As mentioned, only seven of the merchant vessels were captured. The balance of the convoy managed to continue to West, uh, West Indies. But Hawke sent the sloop Weasel to warn the British Leeward Island Squadron, which was under Commodore George Pocock, of their approach. And this meant that Pocock was able to position himself to intercept some of the merchant vessels but more importantly, to trap many others in Caribbean ports before they could even get out. And even if they get out, then they come home, they don't have ships to get their ships lined to get them out, but if they, when they don't come home, they won't have their ships lined to escort them, 
and so the British will mop up that money. Now, with va battles like this going on, and let's be honest, Finisterre is quite a cool one at 747, it's unsurprisingly, then, that the very interesting Antenne Francois de Chuzel, Duke de Chuzel, the... How do I put this? Um... The Foreign Minister of France, well, First Minister of State, and Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, because he was Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs from 1758 to October 1761, and was made First Minister of State in the same time, 1758, and would hold that post till December 1770. Well, he had been all sorts of things. Goodness gracious me. But no. He's, unsurprisingly, when it comes 12 years ago, 12 years later, and they're still dealing with the annoyance of the British, they decide what they must do, what they must do, is invade Britain. And he has many plans. Many, many plans. He quite rightly perceived that Britain's strength was its naval power. He felt that if a large French force managed to cross the Channel without being intercepted, it could triumph over the relatively weak British land forces. Theoretically, in practice, I think he would have had more difficulty than often is presumed. Because again, in British internal infrastructure is interesting, and there are lots of places in Britain which are not great for armies to get through. And they might be surprised by just how many troops appear. Again, Britain does have garrisons in Britain. And again, it's without being intercepted. Even if they're intercepted in a partial way, even if they're attempts to resupply are intercepted, all these things are going to affect the operations. Now, he initially believed that he could invade without involving French warships. Believing that trying to get warships out of Brest would, would cause unnecessary delays. And... Therefore, well, he had great plans. A mass fleet of flat bottom transport craft would carry an army of 100,000 troops across the Channel, where they'd be landed in the southern coast of England. Now, these vessels would require speed. They'd have to have a favourable wind to cross the Channel, and once landed, they could easily overpower the British Army. That's the theory. 100,000 troops quickly across the channel. Now, this became the cornerstone of the French strategy in 1759, along with an attempt to capture Hanover. The French began their preparations by trying to build hundreds of flat bottom transport craft at Le Havre, Brest, St. Malo, Nantes, Molo, and Molay, and Lorient. Uh, they spent an estimated uh, 30 million livres on the construction of these vessels. A number of uh, small, well armed escorts were also constructed, and by midsummer they had roughly 325 transports near completion. Now, 48,000 troops were immediately ready to take part in an invasion, but please don't remember the original plan? 100,000 troops. Now it's 48,000. Okay, things have dropped down, and it's 325 transports. Now, they conducted drills and found the troops could embark and dispark from the ships in just seven minutes. Now you're probably thinking, hang on. If they're carrying all these troops... If they're carrying all these troops, and there's only this many ships, how many supplies are they carrying? Well, not a lot. 
not a lot at all. So it'd been a very interesting supply scenario. Throughout 1759, several points of the plan are altered. Chosil had insisted on launching a crossing without fleets and ports initially, um, and the French decided to launch the invasion force entirely from La Havre. In June, French planners decided to agree that a separate small force would be sent to Scotland to try to support Jacobite operations and crush British resistance in a pincer movement. Uh, Duke de Argon was selected to take command of the force, and uh, the plan was that once they landed on the Clyde, 20,000 Scottish Jacobites, Highland clansmen, would rise and join him. And Prince Subis was given command of the larger sovereign invasion. The plan, um, the idea was that um, Subis' force would wait for good winds and then cross the channel speedily from La Havre, landing in Portsmouth, which was one of those places which was actually garrisoned and protected on the British coast. Unfortunately, the British have worked out what's going on quite early on. And so, the British decide to do a raid on Le Havre, which destroys a number of the transports. This gave some of the British commanders an idea that they had managed to achieve a greater setback than, the, than they actually had on the French, but luckily Hawke and several of the admirals are going, no. And the French start to scale back their initial plans. Um, a war council in Paris decides to launch the expedition on Scotland first, and only if it was successful to send follow-up forces to Portsmouth and Maldon in Essex. Again, they don't seem to have very good ideas or charts of these two areas, because honestly, some of the ships they're talking about sending is not a good idea. Now, delays to the assembly of major force were pushed back to the date of the launch, and the sea grew rougher and more dangerous to cross, because as you go on further in the year, the channel does not get nice. In October, the Gullin arrived at his command centre at Vannes, near to where much of his army was gathered, and for five days after 15 October, the British blockading squadrons were forced to withdraw from the French coast by a storm. This enabled the French invasion force to sail, theoretically, but Conflans, the commander, declines to leave harbour as he believed his fleet was not ready. And so, on 20th October, the British returned and uh, the blockade the French Atlantic ports again. And at this point, they have also decided that they need fleet coverage. They have decided that they cannot do it without fleet support. The idea of being able to cross the channel without the fleet, at least drawing off the Royal Navy, has been given up on. Unfortunately for them, this leads to another problem. The British have not been idle. The British might have been lulled into a bit of a false sense of security, but some of them, by La Havre, but the whole time, the British have been doing replenishment at sea. This has been what Hawke's been up to. And this is a quote from his naval physician, James Lind, writing in 1779, quote is in Command of the Ocean, Nicholas Rogers' book. It is an observation, I think, worthy of record that 14,000 persons pent up in ships should continue for six or seven months to enjoy a better state of health upon the watery element than it can well be imagined so great a number of people would enjoy on the most healthful spot of ground in the world. Now, how do you do this? You keep your ships clean. You keep your ships, uh, your crews exercised, well trained, well drilled, fit. But you also have to keep them fed. And you have to keep the ships going back and being repaired and fed as well. So you've got roughly 30 ships, as we talked about. You've 32 ships, 
you have a fleet of usually 21 to 22 with you. So to think about that, it's 10 ships. As a rule, you have roughly three or four sailing back to Port or to Plymouth. Three or four in Plymouth, and three or four sailing from Plymouth at any time. You also have constant supplies of fresh food being brought out. You're going to sit there and go, well, you know, that must require convoying them. Think about it. You've always got some ships sailing with you, uh, sailing out and some ships sailing back. So what they do, they attach the merchant vessels which are carrying the supplies, or which ships, small ships which are full of supplies, to those ships of the line sailing south or sailing north. So with that conveyor belt of ships going backwards and forwards, they always have the supply ships going backwards and forwards. So they have constant fresh vegetables, constant fresh food, and fresh meat. This also means that as a rule, if Hawk is worried about anything, he usually has 21 ships there. He can always stop the three which are supposed to go home from leaving. And he does that. And um, because he can go, you know, yes, it's been a while since you've been home. But in the nicest way, not that long. You're all healthy, you're all happy, you're all well fed, and I've got problems coming up. I think they're moving. And this is why when the Battle of Quiberon Bay takes place in 1759, that usually 21 ship fleet, which is against what would normally be expected to be a French force of 21 ships, is 24 ships. And five frigates versus 21 ships and six frigates. Now, during the first week of November, a westerly gale had come up, and after three days, the ships of Hawke's blockade were forced to run for Torbay. Robert Duff was left behind with the inshore squadron in Quiberon Bay, and his squadron was uh, five fifties and nine frigates to keep an eye on the transports of the French, uh, the French invasion force. In the meantime, a small squadron from the West Indies managed to join Conflans in Brest. And when an easterly wind came on the 14th, Conflans managed to slip out. He was sighted by HMS Acton, which remained on station off Brest. Unfortunately, she failed to rendezvous with Hawk. And Juno and Swallow, which tried to warn Duff, but were chased off by the French. And by the victualling ship, Love and Unity, um, which was returning from Quiberon. Luckily, the victualling ship met Hawk the next day, and so he sailed for Quiberon hard. And HMS Vengeance, same day, arrived in Quiberon the, mm, to warn Duff. And so he put his squadron to sea on the uh, in the teeth of a um, west northwesterly gale. Now, thankfully, for the British, Confluence had unfavourable winds. 
and he'd, so he slowed down on the night of the 19th in order to arrive in Kubron. at dawn. And remember again, these are places which have a lot of trouble to get in and out of. You know, we've talked about already the joy that is getting in and out of Brest. Well, Quiberon Bay itself is not exactly the easiest things to get in and out of. And that's where the troops are. Because whilst they have managed to get out of Brest, they've had to go south to go and pick up the troops because the troops have had to be there because Brest can't support those soldiers. Now, when Confluence realised that the force he sighted originally, he sighted because he sighted Duff's squadron, was not the main fleet, he gave chase, and Duff split, split his ships into north and uh, to the north and south, with the French van and centre in pursuit, whilst the rear guard of the French fleet held off to windward to watch some strange sails appearing from the west. Ouch! The French broke off pursuit when they realised um, that Hawke's fleet was coming into sight from the west and but the, the trouble the damage had already been done they were now scattered as anything HMS Magnamy sighted the French at 8.30 hours and Hawke gave the signal for the line abreast mm -hmm. Conflans at this point is faced with a very nasty choice Fight in his disadvantaged radius position in the high seas with a violent west northwesterly wind, or take up a defensive position in Kubron Bay and dare Hawk to come into the shoals and reefs and get him. At about 9 am, Hawk gave the signal for general chase, along with a new signal for the first seven ships to form a line ahead, and in spite of the weather and dangerous waters, set full sail. By 1430 hours, Conflans rounded Le Cardinal, the rocks at the end of the Kiberon Peninsula. The first shots were heard as he did so. This is despite the fact that um, Sir John Bentley who was in command of the war spite which fired the first shots claimed they were fired without his orders. Yeah, war spite's machine spirit, living up even in 1759. The captain going, I didn't give orders to fire the shots. I know they've hit the French, but I didn't give those orders. And the crew are just going, it went off, we didn't. We loaded the cannons, ready to fire, and they went off. We did nothing. War Spike going, I will get closer. I know, a little bit of humor there, but it's a tradition with an HMS War Spike. At this point, though, the British were already starting to overtake the front rear of the French fleet, even as their van and center made it into the safety of the bay. So this is the point. Conflans has made the choice of, I'm going to go for safety. And he hasn't got there in time, which means now he's left his rear exposed and that can get swallowed up. Rather like what happened in the previous battle of Clinister. Now, at roughly 4pm, the uh, Formidable surrendered to the resolution. This was just as Hawk himself, rounded the Cardinals. Cassin attempted to come to the aid of Conflans, but uh, Tesere, uh, Tezi uh, performed her turn without closing her lower gun ports, and so water rushed into her gun deck and she capsized, with only 22 survivors. Superb also capsized, and a badly damaged Heros struck her flag to Viscount Howe, before running aground on the foreshoal during the night. This is just not good. Unfortunately, at this point, the wind shifted from being west northwest to northwest, which 
honestly, just made Conflans, jo uh, Conflans mess already worse, and he was in a mess of situation. He made theoretically the right decisions, but he just had no luck in pulling them off. He had no luck in pulling them off at all. Now, Conflans tried to resolve the muddle that his fleet was now in, but in the end decided that the only option was to put to sea again. Unfortunately, his flagship Soliroyal heads for the entrance of the bay just as Hawk is coming in on the Royal, so aboard the Royal George. Hawk tries to go for the Soliroyal and Raker, but the Intrepid interposes herself and takes the fire. Unfortunately, Sully Royal had fallen to leeward and was forced to run back and anchor off Crozac, away from the rest of the French fleet. By this point, it's 1700 hours and darkness had fallen, so Hawke makes the signal to anchor. During the night, eight French ships managed to do what the Sully Royal had failed to do, and that is navigate through the shoals to the safety of the open sea and escape to Rochefort. Which is a bit of a problem. Here's the thing. You've already lost ships, and now your ships are running away. Seven ships were in the Villain industry, but Hawk decided not to attack them in the stormy weather. And the French jettisoned their guns and gear and used the rising tide and northern wind to escape over the sandbar uh, of the bottom of the river. So they basically, they had jettisoned their everything, made themselves fighting useless to try and get away from the British fleet. One of the ships was actually wrecked in the process, and the remaining ships were trapped throughout 1760 by a blockading British squadron and only managed to break out and reach Brest in 1761 too, sort of at the end of 1761, December, January. The badly damaged Just was lost as she made for Loire, only 150 of her crew survived the ordeal, and the resolution grounded on the foreshore during the night. That's, of course, the British vessel, the Resolution, which had managed to take the surrender of the Formidable earlier. Sodorel tried to escape um, to the safety of the batteries at Crossack, but Essex pursued her, with the result that both were wrecked off the four, on the foreshell beside Heros. And on the 22nd, the gale moderated and three of Duff ships were sent to destroy the beach vessels. Conflans set fire to Solo Royal, and the British burnt Heros. And that is the Battle of Quiberon Bay in 1759. It's a mess, but it happens. And then we have the Battle of Ushant in 1778. This time, August Keppel and Hugh, Kellop, uh, Hugh Palace uh, uh, are in charge. 29 ships line from the British versus 30 ships line from the French. Indecisive battle is what it's best called. But honestly, it should be called an absolute frigating mess. And mainly that blame, I would say, lies with Keppel. But it's not so much as it could be. It could have been a lot worse, but I think part of the trouble, uh, I think it's made worse by what happens afterwards with the Keppel Palace affair, which is a forerunner of the Fisher Beresford affair, which almost breaks the Royal Navy. Because Keppel doesn't say anything publicly about Palliser, but Palliser's from the other political side, and he allows his nephew to publish letters, which he was criti uh, critical of Palliser in. And so it ends up in a court-martial, and it ends up in all sorts of issues, and yeah, it basically causes, there's a reason why, if we go back to the command, K 
Keppel is one of those officers who um, suddenly disappears. If you consider previous officers, they get many times in command, they get lots of experience. Keppel is one of the rare ones in that he turns up once, and usually when issues like this happen, it, when they sort of they only turn up once, it's because there has been some sort of issue with their command. Or they were just interim commander while they waited for someone who was better come back from another posting. The Battle of Oshant, as said, was a mess. Um, at 0600 hours on 27th of July, the British fleet were roughly line abreast. Keppel gave the order for the rear division, which was under Sahayu Palliser, to chase to windward after spotting the French. At 0900 hours, the French, who Hitro had been sailing in the same direction, several miles to windward, went about once more. As the rearmost ships of the British, uh, the French fleet were attacking, the wind changed, allowing the British to close the gap in between them and their quarry. At 10.15 hours, the British were slightly leeward, lying ahead on the same course as the French. A little later, a change in wind direction brought about a rain squall, which um, cleared up by about 1,100 hours. And a further change of wind direction to the southwest gave the British the advantage. Ordeus, Ordeus, of the French commander, sought to negate this by ordering ships about. The French were now heading towards the British in loose formation and would pass slightly to the windward. The French ships were a few points off the wind and ordered them to close haul to give the Britain the greater speed, but this also caused the French line to veer slightly away from the British. This event, the battle began at 11.20 hours, when the fourth French ship in the line was able to bring her guns to bear. Keppel decided he would save his salvo for the enemy flagship, and so received the broadsides of six French ships without reply. Now, after he'd fired on the 110-gun Bretagne, he continued to attack the next ships, uh, six ships in the French line, Considering the speed of and pace of the battle, um, I can understand his idea, but um, he could have at least fired on some of those six ships and still may have, still had a full broadside ready to go for the Bretagne. The British van under Robert Harlan passed the end of the French line. Harlan ordered ships to uh, about so as to chase the French rear guard, which included the vessel of the Sphinx. Now, Pallas's ten ships of the rear had not formed line of battle, instead being in a, in a loose, irregular formation. Um, this was partially due to Keppel's earlier orders and partially due to the fact that he hadn't had time with the wind to keep changing direction. As a result, Pallas' division is badly mauled. That's the whole point of the line of battle. It's a good defensive formation if you can hold it. Because it's attacked piecemeal. At 1pm, Victory passed the last French ship and attempted to follow Harland, but so badly damaged in the Marsen rigging that Kevil had to uh, wear around and it was 2 p.m. before his ships were on the opposite tack. Now, victory we are talking about, for which Augustus Keppel is in at this point, is the victory we know and love. Nelson's victory. In about this time that Palace and Formidable emerged from the battle downwind of Keppel's own division. The French line had, in the meantime, tacked and was now heading south on a starboard tack and threatening to pass the British fleet to leeward. The French practice of firing high into the rigging had managed to make several of the British ships being disabled, and it was this group that Keppel now stood down towards whilst making signal form line of battle. By 4 pm, 1600 hours. Harlan's division had gone about and joined Keppel's ships in line, but Palliser could not conform his ships 
Um, there is an argument where he would not, but honestly, Pallister is not the type to not do something unless he cannot do it. He's There's a dispute as to how political he is. But basically, they'd appointed the fleet commander from the faction which was opposite the faction, the, the political part, the, the government's ruling fa politics. And so they'd sent a second in command who was supposedly friendly with him and who was supposed one of the closest friends but belonged to the other side. That was Palliser. And this is where there's weirdness because it's, you know, Palliser at this point has been one of Keppel's oldest friends. Yes, he comes from the other political side. But, yeah, he's he, if he could have confirmed the script, he would have. And his ships formed up around, tried to form up around him, which was several miles upwind from the rest of the British fleet. This is Palliser's ships. Dovols did not attack the British fleet, um, while it was divided in three sections, but instead continued his course and passed the British fleet to, windward, to leeward. At 1700 hours, Keppel sent the sick freight, HMS Fox, to demand that Palliser join the main body of the fleet, and when this failed, at 1900 hours, Keppel removed Palliser from the chain of command by individually sicking, signaling each ship in his division. Now, by the time those ships had joined Keppel, night had fallen, and under the cover of the darkness, the French fleet sailed off. What's interesting is that, honestly, it's doubtful the ships could have joined any quicker, and Palliser was probably trying. He just couldn't make it happen immediately because of the issues he was in, and recovering from the damage his ships had, to have, uh, had taken, including to their sails and their rigging and all the other things which allowed them to actually move. So they're kind of repairing the ships because of what had happened earlier with the earlier commands going through the ships. There are issues. Now... What happens after the battle is almost more interesting because in what becomes known as the Pallister Keppel Affair, it's found that logbooks have been altered, notes have been removed, and both Palliser and Keppel are court-martialed. Court-martial, uh, Keppel is cleared of misconduct in action, but he never again gets to command a fleet. He just doesn't. And the fact he praised Palliser in his public dispatch and then attacked him in private meant that he kind of eroded his own position because if he'd really thought that Palliser had been dishonourable, had dishonoured the flag, had all these things, he should have mentioned in his public dispatches, but he doesn't. Both were tried and acquitted. Both don't get further commands. And he managed to, well, he tried to, he joined, he became First Lord of the Admiralty, and he's raised to the peerage as a Viscount Keppel of Elven, which is in Suffolk, sworn into Privy Council, but he resigns in protest against the Peace of Paris, and then he joins the Coalition Ministry, which is formed by Northern Fox, and disappears from public life in 1783, when that has fallen from office. He dies unmarried in 1786. With Burke, that is, of course, Edmund Burke, stating that he had something high in his nature and that it was a wild stock of pride on which the tenderest of all hearts had grafted the milder virtues. 
as he dies, unmarried and without issue, the peerage dies with him. Mm. Now, that's not one of the last battles the Western Squadron is in Melbourne, but definitely the last major one, because by this point, the Western Squadron becomes very committed and very good as its point of security. But it's always the squadron which the French have to go and clear out the way using other ships so they can get the Brest fleet out and so they can attack the channel. So again, if you ever ask the question of what would have happened if the Franco-Spanish fleet had won the Battle of Trafalgar? The next battle would have been with the Western Squadron. Which would have been bigger. Well, was actually bigger than Nelson's squadron. And probably would have been a lot nastier. Because if they lost the battle, or if the if they lost the battle, then maybe the fleet in Brest would come out, or alternatively, the fleet in Brest would have come out at the same time to meet up with this Franco-Spanish squadron, which had survived whatever had survived the Battle of Trafalgar and won and got on. They'd be fighting the Western Squadron. Now, the Western Squadron itself would have been reinforced. And the Western Squadron was being reinforced. So they would have probably picked up whichever British ship survived the Battle of Trafalgar. And they would have probably got reinforced by whatever ships were available from England as well to get down from, you know... Well, I would love to say you could bring uh, ships down from Scotland and Wales, but honestly they probably wouldn't have got there in time. So it would have been the ones which were in the English ports and probably the ones in Plymouth, but maybe some of the ports with vessels might have got there in time. But this is, these are some of the battles you have in the Battle of Oshant. And that's another reason why I wanted to talk about the Western Squadron and Brest, because, you know, Battle of Oshant, 1944. Good reason to read my book. Especially when it comes out in the next edition. If that happens, which it should do soon, I've got to send in some notes. And again, if you have any issues with my book in terms of you've noticed spelling mistakes, etc., please mention them down below because I'm going to try and revise it and get those things fixed in the next edition. If any did get through all the all the long process. But a lot of battles are taking place off of Shant, and the reason is because of the fact that the French have to come out to there and the British are there to stop the French getting out. So that's why there have been so many battles there. It's a good place where they meet up. And still to this day, major base. So that's the blockading of Brest and the story of the Western Squadron a little bit. And that's on their battles and what they get up to. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. The question today is, again, you know, I've given you the curious example of the British who I wouldn't say are more technologically advanced than anyone else in this time. I'd say everyone's pretty much of a muchness. But the British... You know, as technologies develop, you put a certain emphasis in certain things, and so you develop a capability, which, whilst it's not technologically out of the reach of others to emulate and also do, it's not something they've invested in the infrastructure and support to develop up. So in this case, it's the British Rear Supply at Sea and the Replenishment at Sea and the Keeping the Fleet at Sea and all the other efforts they put into that. I'd like you to think about and think about other points in history where these sort of advantages have come about, where nations have, due to necessities and circumstance and the strategic in the scenario of they themselves face, they develop a skill which no one else really has at the time. They could develop if they wanted to, but no one else wants to. So it looks like it's a technological advantage when actually it's more a case of we've had to develop this because of our scenario and now we're going to use it to an advantage. So it's something which they're forced to do, they then use to their advantage. Right. Of course, got the glorious first of June coming up on the first of June. Sorry, this didn't go. Li this is not not going to go live and times a long trial at a normal time it normally does, and it's not going to be a case of the live is happening on the Saturday rather than the Thursday. But as said, I'm still getting over my sister's cooking. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed. And as ever, thank you very much for your support. I wouldn't be able to do any of this without it. 
you know, without the people who subscribe, without the people who watch the vid channels, who, without the people who are members, are patrons, I just wouldn't be able to do any of all this. Because, seriously, you make the history research actually viable. It's brilliant. I'm doing something which I was always told never be possible. You'll never be able to make enough money to fund history research. There's maybe six or seven posts for nail historians in the entire country. And, yeah. Thanks to you, it's possible. Next week, we have the Ironclad Frigates of the Line. Oh, that's going to be fun. That is going to be fun. <laughs>